This is Bewilderbeasts, an infotainment show dedicated to inspiring curiosity for all ages by investigating the ways animals intersect at humanity. I am not a historian, an ethologist, a researcher, a scientist, a zoologist, a trained audio engineer, or an expert in, well, anything. Y'all, I'm lucky if I can remember to put my clean laundry in the dryer before it gets funky. And while I make every effort to present things as accurately as I can with a fun flair, I'm going to mess up. And that's okay. I hope I've given you a nice place to jump off from on your own adventures into curiosity. Or at the very least, I've given you the key to win your next round of trivia. Welcome to Bewilder Beasts. I'm your host, Melissa McHugh McGrath, still recording from the tiniest podcast studio closet outside of Boston, Massachusetts. Today, we're going to talk about how feeling sluggish might take on a whole new meaning after today's episode, the harbor seal that became a harbor master, and alligators have a cool defense strategy by turning into popsicles. Okay, let's go. So guys, I am recording today on March 11th. This is the one year anniversary of when COVID lockdowns hit our city. And I know that's been different all the way around the country and different states and cities had different experiences with how lockdown went down and how COVID was taken seriously or not. But um, in our city, things went down on my 39th birthday. And yesterday, uh, we got a call or a communication from our school saying that it is finally safe. The teachers feel safe. The students feel safe. The parents, the community, the school district feel safe for our school. One of 10 in our city um, is safe enough to go back to. My kid was going to have to go either to remain online for the rest of the year, which she was more than happy to do because she doesn't like going into new places. So her alternative was to go to a high school, um, a brand new high school, one that I can't wait for her to actually see, but that I would rather she sees when she's in ninth grade instead of third. Um, But yeah, so instead of going to the high school or choosing remote, she gets to go back to her actual real school, her home that she's been missing for a year. And, And I wasn't really prepared for how emotional that would be. Um, and we still have some choices to make as a family as to like what the best course of action is for us. But for now with vaccines on the horizon, the day before the anniversary of the shutdowns for her taking a two week break from school that turned into a year, it, it finally feels hopeful. So if that's your experience, yay, we're finally with you. If it's not, you'll be there too soon. And <sighs> Just trust science and trust experts. Today, we're going to be talking about some really cool things. One of them is actually a story from my childhood about Andre the Seal. Um, And I remember going, uh, (laughs) I remember going to college in Ohio, not realizing that not everyone gets main news. So when I would talk about Andre, no one else knew who I was talking about. This was from the same person who when I finally saw the Great Lakes for the first time, I saw Lake Erie. I attended Lake Erie College. So my friends and I, we went out to go see Lake Erie. And the whole time I was there, everyone was telling me, it's just like the ocean. It's just like the ocean. It's just like the ocean. And these people have clearly never seen the ocean. So we get to the beach. It's it's huge in that you cannot see all the way across um, the ocean in the same way that you can't see all the way across the ocean to like Europe from Maine. But the similarities really stop there. It doesn't smell like the ocean. It doesn't behave like the ocean. So when we rolled in and I took my beach towel and I walked, I don't know, about 40 yards, 30 yards up from the shore um, to put down my towel and everybody else was right up on the shoreline. And they were like, where are you going? I'm like, well, when the tide comes in, And they all looked at me like I was on another planet. And this was because as somebody who grew up in Maine on the coast, I grew up in mid-coast Maine, and you're going to hear a lot about that today. 
in the Andre segment that when you grow up on the coast and you know how the ocean tides work and that if you put your beach towel right next to the water when you roll in, the tide's going to come in and suck up all your stuff and take it out to sea. So when I did that at the lake, clearly I was the person to be made fun of and I deserved it because I forgot lakes aren't oceans. Um, so yeah, we're going to be talking about har- uh, harbors, oceans, mid-coast Maine, my home, my home that I hope I will get to see very soon, hopefully this year, after we get our vaccines and after we get out of Boston. So stay safe, stay vigilant, and, you know, keep wearing your masks, be safe, wash your hands, do all those things. We are not out of the woods yet, but it is palpably close. We are almost there, guys. Almost. Let's just not fumble it on the two-yard line. All right, on with the show. I think the term feeling sluggish is going to take on a whole new bizarre messed up meaning after this segment. Feeling sluggish usually means I'm tuckered out, slow moving, feeling tired. But this one slug can self-decapitate its own head, crawl around and grow an entirely new body. This came as a surprise to one researcher, Sekaya Mito, a PhD candidate who just might get her doctorate in slug self-decapitation, the coolest doctorate I have ever heard of. You see, there are lots of animals who lose limbs defensively. Sea stars are famous for regenerating limbs when they're attacked by predators. The same for octopus and lizards who regrow tails. But this is the first documented case of an animal regrowing an entire body in a period of only three weeks with its head just kind of crawling around. Sayaka Mito told the New York Times that when she found this creature in the tank, it looked weird. No kidding. But when she noticed the slug's head was just bopping around the tank, chomping on breakfast while the rest of the body was, well, laying over there. Nothing to see here. Bodiless slug coming through. The running theory is that these sea slugs have figured out how to go through this process of self-decapitation and that they will ditch their bodies when they become infected with internal parasites. Apparently, the body part doesn't regrow a head, but the head can regrow the body, so this is very much a one-way street. The other thing is that the body still responds to touch and tactile input for months before finally giving up the ghost. The headless, headless ghost of itself. The sea slugs that are being studied for this are also called solar slugs, meaning they get some powers and abilities from the chloroplasts that they eat. See, when plants convert energy from the sun, they use chloroplasts to create sugar that they can use as energy. And that is as far as my horticultural knowledge goes. But if you like this process and this idea, you can go check out another podcast I really like called Planthropology. They can sort you out over there with all the information that I'm totally stumbling through right here. Anyway, because they use these chloroplasts, it might explain how they can convert energy without organs that they left in their body. That body, you know, over there way over there, as far away from my head as I chomp on this algae over here. Mmm, algae. So while lizards have a breakage plane over their tails, think of a perforation in your notebook. If a predator were to grab the tail, the tail can rip away easily and prey can zip off, take the day to heal, then get back out there, champ, tailless for a few weeks, but until one grows back. Yeah, those specific sea slugs also have a breakage plane, but it's on their neck. You know, where a 90s choker from Delia's catalog would have gone instead of running away from predators, it appears that they use that breakage plane to remove their own head and escape their own bodies because the parasite call is coming from inside the house. More study needs to be done. But I cannot wait to see what cool superpowers these slugs have. Nature is wild, y'all. If you grew up in Maine's mid-coast region as I did, y'all know of Andre the Seal. In fact, when I moved to Ohio for college, I was stunned that not everyone knew of this miraculous entertainer who became a living legend in Penobscot Bay. When Harry Goodridge, a scuba diver, tree surgeon, and harbor master, 
It's Maine. All of this tracks. Harry found an orphan seal pup in 1961. The pup was assumed to be about two days old and he couldn't fend for himself. He just thought help him survive and maybe he'd have a scuba buddy for a few dives. Again, it was the 60s. Everything made sense in the 60s. The idea was that he would just go out with Andre a few times and one day the seal would just go off into the ocean. And this was not unusual for Harry as he had a habit of bringing animals home to his five children to help rehabilitate and make them well enough to send back into the wild as best as he could. So Harry Goodridge did what he had done many times before. He brought the baby seal home and planned to help him survive long enough to be free. That's what the other animals have done that Harry brought home, but that is not what happened to Andre. Andre did not go on a few scuba dives and into the ocean. Andre always chose to go home with Harry. He made that choice for 25 years. And not everyone in Harry's harbor decided that Andre's behavior was cute and fun. In fact, as the water got colder and colder and fishermen got more and more agitated with Andre perceiving tugging on oars and sleeping in their fishing boats and giving their dinghies that are not made for 250 pounds of awkwardly thumping blubber, to climb up on and snooze, a few dinghies did sink in the marina. Additionally, if you're a seal who loves people, scaring off the fish was all fun and games. He is a wild animal after all. But Harry became more and more nervous that there might be a accident from the fishermen regarding Andre. And I hope you heard the air quotes. Though to be honest, most people loved Andre and his joy. Andre would perform tricks like wave to the audience from a floating dock, jump through a hoop, toss a small ball through a basketball net, and more. And as word of Andre spread through the little tourist town, people became obsessed with this unintentional sideshow, the little performance seal. See, Andre would shake hands and he seemed to love kids. And you can watch all of this on YouTube if you just search for Andre the Seal. He would hop into the back of Harry Goodridge's car, which was basically a land boat because the cars of the 70s were as big as the hair from the 80s. The seal would stretch out in the back seat and go home every night. He'd watch TV, he'd eat snacks in the kitchen, he'd flop around and play with the dogs and sleep in the house. Andre loved the bathtub, and he really behaved more like a family spaniel than a wild sea mammal. But then the next morning, he'd hop back in the car and drive with Harry back to the harbor. Here, he would swim and chase fish, upset the fishermen, and make friends with tourists. As winter closed in, it became clear that Andre's way of life was not going to be sustainable through the winter in Rockport. Winters in Maine are unforgiving, icy, brutally cold. And while seals usually survive this typically in groups, Andre had a human group. Andre also had some people who didn't like him very much. Andre walked the line between the human world and the sea world, and he didn't fit in quite perfectly in either place. And with the fishermen getting more and more upset, Harry made an unusual decision. He called the Boston Aquarium and essentially said, yo, I have this seal. He's become part of my family. Don't judge me. And I don't think he's going to survive the winter for, well, reasons. Can he hang out with all y'all until spring and I will release him back into the ocean in the spring? The aquarium agreed to this one-time situation. They agreed to this one-time situation 25 times in a row because Andre was an incredibly determined little seal and he knew where home was. Harbor seals until rather recently were not considered migratory animals. And there's a lot to be said for the Clean Water Act helping us understand more about natural seal behavior. Seals who have been killed and unable to live in harbors like Boston and New York because for over a hundred years, raw sewage would go directly into the harbor. And eventually it would pollute everything so badly that nothing could survive. No fish, no plants. And if flatfish were found, they had tumors all over their bodies from pollution. So it's no wonder that we didn't think of seals as migratory animals. There was nowhere for them to migrate to where they could survive. But luckily, they are coming back. In fact, it appears that while they are considered non-migratory at the time, they stayed within 30 miles of home. We now can see data that seals can go from 62 to 250 miles from home thanks to GPS data and tagging from researchers. We also can see now, because of large fishing nets, plastic pollution, 
getting caught in anchors and contaminants like oil spills and chemical spills from boats, that they are still very harmful to harbor seals. And now we can start to see that data too. So with all that in mind and knowing what we know now, what happens to Andre in his next chapter is even more miraculous. So for 25 years before we knew that they could migrate, there was one migrating seal that we knew of and his name was Andre. Harry loaded Andre up in the car, probably stopped at the Kennebunk rest stop for a shake as all good Mainers do, then continued on to the big city of Boston. He paid an arm and a leg for parking, I'm sure, and he got Andre to the caretakers where Andre ate fish, swam around, hung out, made friends, and several months later, Harry came back to the aquarium to pick up Andre, put him in the back seat of his station wagon, probably slipped him a french fry from the rest stop, and then dropped him off in the ocean. Then Harry Goodridge hopped in his car and drove home, with Andre slowly disappearing in his rearview mirror into the sea. Andre had never been away from humans. Andre had never swum the Massachusetts shoreline. Andre never had another seal to show him how to follow currents, fish for himself for days on end. Andre had never once had to cross under the Passamaquoddy Bridge connecting New Hampshire to Maine and back home to a tiny coastal tourist town midway up the fourth longest coastline in the United States. If Andre was going to make it back to the ocean and join a group of seals, this would have been the opportunity and the time. With all of this against him, Andre should never have ever seen Harry again. Andre might have disappeared into the ocean where everyone would have wondered about what happened to the little seal, hoped that he made it back to the ocean, but worrying that maybe he didn't make it. But whatever happened, happened. And what would have happened with him as a wild seal going home seemed right. Harry continued working, doing his thing, mastering the harbor, helping tourists, all that stuff. And one day, a few days after his excursion to the big city, Andre showed up at Rockport Harbor. And boy, were his flippers tired. Andre did go home. He swam 150 miles through the cold, unforgiving New England Ocean to find home. Andre chose to go home, to Rockport, to Harry. You could not walk into a kitschy souvenir shop in Rockport, Camden, Rockland, or any mid-coastal main town without finding Andre the Seal stuffed toys, Andre decorative plates, sealed with a kiss, shirts, and Andre's face. Andre was as much a part of Midcoast Maine as lobsters, clam chowder, trucker hats, and Subarus. Now in 1985, Andre started to go blind. It was pretty clear he couldn't see well, and it was taking its toll. He still always chose to go home with Harry, and he always chose to go to the harbor in the morning. One day, Andre was chilling on the rocks, seal gonna seal, when a younger, tougher male seal did what male seals do. They start fights that they can hopefully win. And they fought. It was brutal and loud and ferocious. Andre likely didn't see him coming or as a seal not acclimated to such interactions with his old age, couldn't fight back. He didn't have a chance. But he had a choice. He chose with his injuries to dive into the water and swim away. And he never came home. It's said that animals know when it's their time to cross the Rainbow Bridge. Whether he knew it or not that it was his time, we can never know, but Harry knew something was wrong. Andre did not come back to the car that night, or the next, or the next. Sometime later, a male harbor seal's body had washed up on the shore. There were lots of bruises on the body, and as everyone knew, Andre was missing, likely hurt. And they called Harry, who had been searching high and low on the rocks for Andre, Eventually, it was confirmed that this seal was the beloved, unofficial harbor master of Rockport's Harbor. Harry took his friend's body and buried the 5-foot, 250-pound seal in the family backyard. His daughter noted that there's great irony that Andre is buried on land, while her father, Harry Goodridge's ashes, were eventually put to rest at sea. But the remarkable thing was that this was always Andre's choice. Always. And in my line of work with dogs, choice is key. 
Giving an animal the choice is gaining traction, and that's the way I prefer to teach animals. And clearly it worked for Harry and Andre. He chose to swim 150 miles every year from my now home in Boston to my childhood home in the Midcoast for 25 years. And he always chose Harry until it was time for him to choose to go home. A statue remains in Rockport's Harbor of Andre. It's something I do visit from time to time when I make the 150-mile journey home to the Midcoast. And when I stop at the Kennebec Crust Stop for a shake and fries and continue on to the salty, fishy air of the harbor, this statue isn't necessarily a memorial, nor is it a grave marker as many think. It was created in the 70s, and Andre himself helped unveil it. It was a lovely day for the press to have them watch Andre unveil his own statue that is still there today, overlooking the harbor that he called home. Over the last few weeks, the news has been devastating out of places in America's South. If you haven't heard what happened in Texas with the power grid, just have fun on that side quest. But one headline hit me. Alligators in Oklahoma turn into popsicles sticking out of the frozen water. So this made me pause for two reasons. The first, Oklahoma has alligators? What? And second, that's the worst summertime treat ever. Yes, um, I'll take a fudgesicle, a chipwich, and a gator stick, please. Here you go, little Billy. That'll be $10. Mind the gator stick. Once he thaws, he bites back. Want a spoon? So what's happening here? Well, they weren't really frozen frozen. They basically turned their snouts into snorkels. When the lakes they live in freeze over, they still have to breathe air. It's a natural response for them to go to shallower water, stick their nose out of the water as it freezes around them so they have a place to breathe, and just, well, chill. The snout stays put, and the gator bodies just kind of dangle below the surface. This is a feature, not a bug, and it's called brumation. It's a temporary hibernation specifically for cold-blooded creatures. Like in hibernation, the metabolism shuts down and there's no need for food, heart rates slow down, and they just wait it out. But what if they're late to the snorkel party? What if a gator is underwater when this happens and they miss it? I mean, there's always one in every group that's like, uh, sorry I missed the time on the invite, what I miss? Well, it turns out in a cold snap a few years ago, researchers watched three alligators who were underwater for 12 hours. That's half a day. Before finally saying, ugh, fine, I'll just make a hole here and chill out too, I guess. And after the ice thaws, all the alligators just go back to the shore and sun themselves like there's no tomorrow. One tip, though, if you see alligators in this position, I highly, highly recommend that you do not run out onto the ice to save them. One, the ice might not be thick enough to support your weight. Two, gators in general, not one for being okay with being disturbed. Just leave them alone and they will be totally fine. Unlike you, if you run out to try to chop them out of the ice. Hi, Gator. What can I get you today? We're just chilling under the ice. I thought I'd get something nice for the kids. I'll, uh, I'll take a fudgesicle, a chipwich, and... Hmm. Do you recommend the billy on a stick? Nature is so cool. And when it comes to gators being cool, just let it be. So thank you for joining me today on Bewilderbeasts. If there are topics that you would be interested in hearing about, know of any historical animals who changed the world, animals who help humans, or other animals who turn to popsicles, send them in to bewilderbeastpod at gmail.com. Tweet at bewilderedpod, bewilderbeastspod on Facebook, and bewilderbeasts on Instagram. I am Melissa McHugh McGrath with Mutt Stuff Media, author of Considerations for the City Dog, co-training director of the New England Dog Training Club, the oldest AKC obedience club in the country, and creator of this podcast. Yes, this one, this one right now that you are listening to in your ear holes. Now go get curious. I got information today on feeling sluggish from the New York Times. I got information on Andre the Seal from NewEngland.com, Wikipedia on Andre the Seal, The New York Times, PenobscotMarineMuseum.org, The Bangor Daily News, an AP article on the obituary of Harry Goodrich, 
a PBS special on Andre the Seal, and an awesome little podcast called New England Legends Podcast. Go to NewEnglandLegends.com, episode 177, Harbor Master Andre the Seal. Alligator Popsicles information came from LiveScience.com and ScienceAlert.com. Links, as always, are in the description of today's episode. Intro music is Tiptoe Out the Back by Dan Leibowitz, and interstitial music is by MK2. Please don't forget to like and subscribe and review and share with your curious friends. You can share episodes from BewilderBeastPod.com or wherever you get your podcasts. Thank you so much for listening, and I will see you next week.